what does it mean for gods to fight? Right, you see, in AOS we've heard of gods and even god beasts fighting with one another. We have, you know, Grimnir and Volcatrix, Sigmar and Gorkomorka. These, you know, titanic battles that leveled mountains and carved canyons and were so epic that they form the basis of some primitive religions within the realms. It's all very vague and, and very over the top, quite frankly. And we've even seen uh, when a god fights mortals, as when Alariel took on her war aspect and annihilated the Nurgle forces guarding uh, the Genesis Gate within Giran. Or Marathi Ascendant coiling around the throat of Anvilgard by claiming the city for her own. But those things, right, the, the mythos side of stuff where it's vague and kind of, you know, long before our time as viewers in this story and mortals versus a god, they're a little bit different, right? They're not the same thing as two deities standing in front of each other toe to toe, right? Forget the mythical stuff. What does this fight actually look like? To have mortals, and servants, sycophants watch their deity sovereign, their king, everything, and reflection of all the realm and authority that they've raised mirrored against them in the battlefield, right? Equal devotion, equal, you know, standing with your deity. Two armies clash. And what are the consequences of such a cataclysm? That's what we hope to explore this week by talking about Broken Realms Teclas, a story that at its heart is about consequence. The consequences of hubris and selfishness, greed and arrogance, culminating in Nagash, Lord of Undeath and the Underworld of Shaiish, going toe to toe with Teclas, the mage god of Hish, the realm of reason and enlightenment. And friends, I hope you join me for this adventure because we're about to go on a wild ride of mistakes, error, misplaced confidence, and again, above all, consequence. Now, if you are just jumping into the narrative of Age of Sigmar, first of all, welcome. I'm so glad to have you. I do suggest checking out my series on Broken Realms Marathi, the first book and the one that came out before this in the Broken Realms series. It's certainly not required reading or anything like that per se, but it happens around the same time frame. So if you're taking in the lore as a whole, I would definitely start there and I'll put a link to that playlist in the description down below. But our story begins here in a small, remote town within Hish called Settler's Gain. This is a picture-perfect example of what the realms could be. Where We have a city of Sigmar filled with all the races that bring that faction to life, as well as a detachment, a local detachment, of Lumineth realm lords within the city. Now, one thing to make uh, immediately clear is the peace between all these different factions. Right? It's, it's very harmonious. The humans here work and toil and thrive. And the Lumineth act as their spiritual leaders, their scholars, and train them in the arts of magic and meditation, hoping that by, you know, settling in Hish, a new level of enlightenment could be given to the race of man and dwarves and all those kinds of things, or all the different races that make up Cities of Sigmar. In fact, we really do learn that the Lumineth have an active role in teaching mankind magics. Which makes sense, they've always been kind of an academic style race. But the realms are not so peaceful as this little quaint city because Nagash, god of undeath, has already set in motion his ploy to seize the realms. The Necroquake, that setting-wide power play that saw all death magic funneled into him, the dead across every realm rise up, be it, you know, zombie, skeleton, or geist, and it birthed an entire new faction, the Nighthaunt. In addition to all that stuff, it radically destabilized not only Shaiish as a realm, but the way magic works in every realm. The Necroquake was a blight upon the natural order of reality, and, and while it did happen a little bit, you know, uh, some time previous to this story beginning, the effects are still being felt. Now as we look upon the city of Settler's Gain, the horizon begins to be set aglow. A colossal night haunt army is on its way. Now, while the Necroquake rose all the dead from around the realms, this was a bit different. It was very well organized. This wasn't some roving band of ghosts that just, you know, got raised and then didn't have a direction. The Nighthaunt leaders had learned from their defeat in Glimsforge, which you can read about in the book Soul Wars by Josh Reynolds. I really do suggest it. And now this army had set its sights on this seemingly random city in Hish, of all places. 
The runes and wards meant to repel the undead were breached, ghosts were pouring into the city, and the free guild put up a very stoic fight, right? They had been trained by the Lumineth about like, you know, your intensity of thought and action and devotion are what allow you to pierce into ghosts rather than just having normal weapons which would pass through them. But, you know, even that being said, they were of limited use against these ethereal forms. That's when the local Lumineth detachment joined the fray. And while they had way more success, there was just so many Night Haunt to fight. And the, the descriptions of imagery depicted in this fight are really quite cool. Like, the Night Haunt hit like a literal tidal wave. They just rolled up the side of walls and castles and flooded streets and towers alike. Like this nightmare fog just coming through the city. And it's at this point, Selenar, the spirit of Hish's moon made manifest, descended upon the city. You see, the Lumineth are unique in their ability to communicate with the spirits of nature. Mountains, rivers, uh, winds, and in this case, the moon of Hish. And allow these elemental spirits to take physical form. And it was at this point that Selenar whispered one word, but a word of power and might. Teclas. And above him, the mage god himself coalesced into reality. The sheer radiance of the god of light was enough to banish a lot of night haunt, and his presence became even more deadly once he began to command the light around him as a weapon, right? He would just pour beams of light across this city, and night haunt would just be evaporated, right? Banished back to Shayish, they would just be put out. And he was able to, you know, banish entire swaths of night haunt, extinguishing them like candlelight being blown out by a soft breeze. One contingent of Night Haunt rose to meet this new threat, because of course Night Haunt can fly, so they just charged up into the sky after him, and mid-flight, Teclas looked upon them. He saw the terrible curse that Nagash had laid upon these souls, right, pushing their eternal punishment into a weapon that he wielded for selfish purposes. And in Teclas' mind, this is not how undead spirits are supposed to be. They're supposed to be in their little perfect afterlives in Shayish, not pressed into a terrible, haunting military service for eternity at the hands of Nagash. So with a word, the spirits hurtling towards him were freed from Nagash's designs. It's like he, he took apart the individual punishments that Nagash had put upon them. And in fact, this is actually, this is, this is really rough. They regained mortal form. So he literally just brought them back to life. And then it's just a bunch of people and horses midair. And of course they plummeted to their deaths immediately, which side note is the most jerk move ever because uh, I don't know, it needs to be an ability in this, some kind of narrative format, right? You turn night haunt back into humans or whatever, only to let them die again is it's, it's awful, but like in the best way possible. But the point wasn't really to eliminate them as enemies, but undo the twisted eternal punishments of Nagash. These souls, even though he just let them drop and die, were now free of their haunted forms. They were free of being pressed into service of an arrogant god. And in barely any time at all, Teclas had cleared away nearly all of the Night Haunt army, leaving only a few scattered leaders alive, allowing them to crawl back to Nagash and make a report. Now, friends, this scene that I just depicted, right, the battle for Settler's Gain, is not even in the first act of this book. This is the prologue. This is them just introducing what's going on in the realms. What we are seeing is that Nagash has fundamentally changed the nature of the realms by destabilizing magic, and even though the Necroquake didn't work as intended, it did raise a whole bunch of undead all over the place, which Nagash quickly solidified into an army with the aid of his Mortark, Lady Olander. And again, the plan did not work perfectly, but Nagash was no less interested in dominating the mortal realms, and that's why he unleashed the Ossiarch Bone Reapers and the Night Haunt to conquer as they please. So this army arrives in Hish, outside Settler's Gain, uh, and it's meant to be an open act of war. Right? This is not some mindless horde that has a side effect of a failed spell. This is a conquering force. And this is an important part of the prologue as it sets up the next conversation. You see, Teclas is mad, <laughs> like, like really actually quite ticked. The entire focus of this faction, the Lumineth Realm Lords, is the finding of peace 
between the residents of the realms and the true nature of them, right? Uh, basically, mend the wounds of the realms themselves. Close any tear or gateway that leads to the realm of chaos. Well, the Necroquake acted as a fresh new insult to their mission because it twisted the natural order of what Shyish was supposed to be. But Teclas, being the mage god, was very confident that he and his people could undo the damage Nagash had done. Which is its own, like, that's one insult, right? Like, you're just totally going against their entire mission, you're trying to break the natural order of things. But in addition to that, he dared to tread on Hish, right? And that's, those two are both transgressions that cannot go unremarked upon. And so at the end of the prologue, there's sort of a cutscene on one of the opening pages showing the Knight of Shrouds, giving Nagash a report of what happened at Settler's Gain. And at this moment, Teclas appears in the presence of Nagash himself. I'm sure it's just sort of like a projection, that kind of thing. But he goes straight into the holiest chambers of Shayish unannounced or uninvited. Which again, is an insult to someone like Nagash. Now I'm going to do a bit of a sum up of their chat. Essentially, Nagash says Teclas will pay for such an intrusion. Teclas responds, yeah, you too, buddy. You marched into Hish. Nagash reveals his logic that wherever death happens, which is literally everywhere, uh, that's where Nagash belongs. So why shouldn't he be there? And they squabble a bit back and forth. Uh, Teclas offers an ultimatum, you know, withdraw your armies from Hish or suffer consequences and basically threatens Nagash's burgeoning necromantic empire, right? The Ossiarch Bone Reapers are now his preferred army, the representation of Nagash's power in the realms. And he's like, oh, it'd be a shame if something were to happen to that. Which, you know, as amusing as it is for us, for readers, uh, is exactly the wrong move to do with Nagash, right? His ego and his presence, uh, ultimatums are not the way to speak to this dude if you actually want him to comply. But then again, this is one of the very few reasonable offers that exists in the Age of Sigmar lore, so I don't know, it's kind of a wash, you know? It's one of those things like, that seems reasonable, but the way that you presented it was completely unreasonable to the person that you're speaking to. At this point, Nagash basically banishes whatever, you know, uh, image or projection of Teclas is there, and he starts giving orders to his Mortarks, okay? Here's the basic plan. I want you to seal as many doors leading to Shayish as possible, and we're going to use them to make the realms suffer as much as possible. And on top of that, Hish needs to suffer the most. Now, my assumption at this point is there are still gates leading out of Shayish, but he's talking about messing with ones that lead into it. Remember, not all realm gates are two ways. And friends, like I said, that was all the prologue. So going forward, we're going to be talking about Act 1, of Broken Realms Techless. And I wanted to pause the video here for the day specifically, because this is an incredibly interesting and important prologue beyond any of these books. First off, we're introduced to a new Cities of Sigmar, Settler's Gain, which there are rules for in this book. But more importantly, it introduces us to our two champions of this narrative, Nagash and Teclas, and the reasons why they're being pitted against one another. Now on the surface, this looks very much like a simple turf war, right? Nagash marched on Hish, Teclas said go away, Nagash said nah, and so they start fighting. But there's actually a lot more going on here. Because these two personalities are simultaneously opposed, yet mirror one another. And here's what I mean. Nagash and the power of Shayish are the ending of things, right? A world of death and stagnation, where Teclas, of the realm of light, of Hish, is defined by a place of enlightenment and reason. One is darkness, the other is light. Obviously, Olgu factors in here as well, but they're really putting these two uh, opposed to one another because Nagash doesn't want you to have any form of enlightenment and reason. He wants subjugation, right? And that's different than, say, something that happens in Olgu. But more importantly, on a personal level, these two characters suffer from the same flaw, hubris. And while they have maybe sometimes similar goals, they go about it very differently and do so in a way that will always inevitably lead to clashes with other factions. You see, Nagash wants to get rid of chaos, right? And that, that's awesome. Say, lots of people do. However, he also wants to see himself made as the ultimate ruler of the realms. His logic is, 
everything dies. It'll be under his control at some point anyway. Why waste the time? Let's just speed it up. And of course, killing all the mortals across every realm is a great way to do that, right? Everything just dies instantly. And this has the one-two punch of cutting off the supply of emotions and acts that feed the chaos gods, which would weaken them. And then with all the dead of the realms at his command, Nagash can finally purge chaos, making him the ultimate hero. On the other side, we have Teclas, a character who consistently decides, I know what needs to be done, and I'm the only one willing to do it. But he does it to a point where there's grave consequences, right? He's intelligent and skilled and from one perspective, usually right, but in his arrogance, neglects bringing others on board with his plans. And all of us can agree from what we learned in grade school, team projects suck, but that does not excuse him. Say, for example, that there was some, you know, unopened realm gate that Teclas needed to shut down or destroy underneath a city. He wouldn't ask permission or try to get innocent people to safety. He would just collapse the city. And again, he's right. The gate needed to be destroyed, but you went about it in the most self-righteous and careless way possible. That's just a hypothetical example I came up with. The entire series of the End Times books is Teclas being a total jerk and undoing all these things because he understands the end conclusion of what we need to fight off chaos, but he goes about it in the worst ways possible. And he also has a plan to rid the realms of chaos. He and his children, the Lumineth Realm Lords, have learned to mend tears in reality, closing the realm of chaos off from the mortal realms. But like in our example, he's not bringing anyone on board with this plan. He's just forming an army and marching all over the place, over everybody else's realm, even though he cares when Nagash comes to his, he doesn't mind going anywhere else, acting like he owns it all, which of course is an act of war, just like Nagash is doing, but his plan, you know, oh yeah, but we're doing this to fix everything. It's like, well, that doesn't matter to everybody else. You're still just marching on my turf. They're so similar in temperament, again, not in the type of power that they wield or in their values, but it's this level of arrogance and hubris that is the ultimate folly of both of these characters. And their plans, however, you know, altruistic or deviant they may be, will lead to folly. And so for the rest of this week, we're going to be talking about the ego of two titans aggressively failing at one another until fists start swinging. And I hope that you will join me for it. But friends, tell me your thoughts. What do you want to see from this coming battle, right? Who's your money on, first of all, if you haven't got the book already? Do not leave any spoilers in the bottom. I really do appreciate it. And do you agree with me on regarding the ego of these two? I know um, the whole like light versus darkness is not the best contrast because Olgu is the darkness. You know, and th that's kind of their thing. Life is the opposite of death, and so on. Like I know that's kind of a weak point, but what I'm saying is like the the characteristics of these two make for a wonderful pairing, right? Just because they're both, like I said, they're gonna aggressively fail at one another. That's my that's my key speech of what this story is gonna look like. Is everybody is so full of themselves that they're going to constantly underestimate one another because they're so sure that they got this on lock and you'll see what i mean throughout the week but i hope that you join me for it if you wouldn't mind when i do these kinds of videos it really does help me on a personal level if you could share this video with friends and let them know about it just because uh, i put a lot of work into these coverages of these big campaign books and it would mean the world to me so friends Thank you so much. Let's continue the conversation down below and I will catch you tomorrow morning. Happy Wargaming.